Kent News 4 has worked diligently to confirm the details of this secret plan, and quite frankly, it was difficult to attain much of that information. Remember, those closest to the project were asked to sign confidentiality agreements or told to keep quiet about the project. Getting sources to reveal critical information took time, but our team has verified a factual account of what's been quietly occurring for years out of public view. And after our first report aired, we began to hear from key players who've been in on the planning since the very beginning. I, J. Kevin Stitt, do solemnly swear. Weeks after Governor Stitt took office, he was meeting with an architect, planning to raise private dollars to build a $6 million home on the grounds of the historic governor's mansion. When I first came into office, I had some business people said, hey, this is in the plans. We would like to do this at some point. Uh, we could raise the money privately for it. Uh, and at some point when you're leaving office, this is an idea for you to leave to the next governor. Those business people, fundraiser Bob Ross and public relations executive Renzi Stone. Ross and Stone say they are proud of their volunteer work, fundraising to ensure Oklahoma first families have a beautiful residence. The public really needs to know where the money's coming from because there's always that question of why why would someone give this much money for this thing that's tied to this government official and not expect anything in august of 2019 the governor's office was telling the public they plan to renovate the historic mansion however according to the project timeline the plans for a new mansion were already complete. Construction scheduled to start in early 2020, ready for the first family to move in March of 2021. Anytime there's a lot of private money going toward a public project, um, I always want to know who's it convenient for, who's it inconvenient for. Who profits, who doesn't profit? When we got here to the governor that, and his communication uh, team have claimed the new mansion project was not a secret. But as we have reported, board members for Friends of the Mansion were asked to sign this non-disclosure agreement. Last year, the president of the board reminded the board to keep everything pertaining to the project confidential. First Lady Sarah Stitt is the chair and chief fundraiser. We called her chief of staff one week before our story first aired. This is Lauren. Hi, Lauren. It's Ali Meyer calling from Channel 4. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thanks. I was looking for the chief of staff for uh, First Lady Sarah Stitt. Is that, have I reached the right person? Yeah, that's me. The First Lady's chief of staff was the executive director of Friends of the Mansion in 2019. The board minutes confirmed she attended many meetings where the board discussed a new mansion. In July of 2020, the board addressed concerns about accepting funds and she was there. In May of last year, the board reported 1.4 million in restricted funds for the new mansion. She was there. In August of 2021, when the fund had grown to $1.6 million, she was there in the room. What I'm asking specifically about is a plan to build a new mansion, not renovate the old one. Yeah, there's not a plan to new, build a new governor's mansion. The governor's press team says that was not a lie. They emphasize the difference between the terms governor's mansion and private residence. They say there is no plan to build a new governor's mansion. There is a plan to construct a private residence. I'm honored to serve on Friends of the Mansion. We take very seriously our, our, our responsibility. Uh, it's, it's not just to the first families. It's to state-owned property that is that should be protected and preserved and in, and maintained for the citizens of Oklahoma. James Pickle has served four governors, Republicans and a Democrat. He is president of the nonprofit board Friends of the Mansion. Our involvement so far has been to uh, take the private donations that are being raised and put them in a restricted bank account to where they cannot be touched for anything but a new first family residence. The board has never voted on the plan to build a new mansion or a new residence. They have no input on the scope. Friends of the Mansion has spent zero dollars so far and cannot answer this question. 
Why was the new mansion kept a secret? I don't have an answer to that. We, we have not been asked. Uh, I, I don't know if it was the intention to just raise it from a smaller group of people, uh, large amounts, fewer people. I don't know if there is a plan to go more public in the future. I, I really don't know. We have asked for the list of donors. Wealthy Oklahomans contributing up to 150000 per person, up to 250000 per foundation. So far, that list remains confidential. I would say there has to be a respect for meaningful transparency. Senator Julia Kirk is leading an interim study on transparency in government. Last session, she authored a bill to address oversight on the grounds of the Capitol complex and the mansion. Her measure did not survive. There's an amount of transparency that has to happen there. There's plans that are made public. You don't just say because a donor wants to do it, we're going to do it. It is not that donor's decision what we do with our public property. News of a new mansion was a shock to many Oklahomans and many lawmakers. Some Republicans in leadership report hearing rumblings about a new mansion years ago, but since the legislature approved millions in renovations to the historic mansion, they believe the new mansion plan was dead. That needs to be a public conversation because the public should weigh in on our history and kind of what we have on our capital grounds. That's absolutely the public's business, you know. We called 17 Republicans in the House and in the Senate. We only heard back from one who agreed to an interview. He canceled the next day. And just yesterday, we got word from the friends of the mansion that they have now decided the donor list will be made public once fundraising concludes. If you would like to read more from the friends of the mansion, Renzi Stone or Bob Ross, we've included their full statements and some additional information regarding our reporting. Just go to KFOR. Com. And it was a wild day for police officers across the Oklahoma City metro, starting with a police chase and then ending with a manhunt downtown. And News 4 has been following it since it began. Let's go back to the start. McIntyre Law Chopper 4 was overhead as a high-speed chase that you're watching now after an armed robbery in Spencer. At one point, police say the suspect tried to ram a police car there were also reports that he may have thrown a gun out of the window. The chase finally ended close to the suspect's home near Northeast 50th and Douglas Boulevard when he crashed into a chain link fence. But the story does not end there. Uh, not even close because of the crash. He was taken to St. Anthony Hospital in Midtown. And that is where News 4's Natalie Clydesdale joins us and picks up the story from here. Natalie. While Dakota Rust did not stay in custody for long, he escaped from jail within an hour of originally being arrested. And this sparked an all-out manhunt this afternoon until he was found hiding just two blocks away inside this storage area. I don't know, I'm looking for a guy in handcuffs and wearing arms. It was a busy Thursday for 21-year-old Dakota Rust. Obviously, he's dangerous. This afternoon, Spencer Police Lieutenant C.O. Moore says Rust led them on a chase, driving the truck he stole while pointing a gun at someone. During the pursuit, he was throwing firearms out of the vehicle. and We had several officers pursuing him. The subject went all the way back around to where he'd stolen it from was taken into custody there on several charges. But Russ didn't stay in custody for long, escaping from St. Anthony's Hospital around 4 o'clock this afternoon, sparking an all-out manhunt. I see a couple cops come around with a drug dog, and I can immediately tell that there's something going on. They come in here, and they're asking me if I've seen anybody in orange jumpsuit. Massengale said he hadn't, but later on in the evening, he heard an unusual noise coming from the storage area shared among the nearby businesses. And I could hear chains and all that stuff, so it sounded like he was, uh, he was full on, I mean, jailbreak mode. So I go around over to the front, and I, uh, I call the cops back over here, and I'm like, hey, I, I think you guys missed somebody back here. He says police went back and found him in this hiding spot. And whenever I came back through here, it was popped off, and you could see way down in there. It's a wow. lot of weight. Yeah, and it goes way down in there. Um, so crazy, isn't it? They then took him into custody again. It's a great relief for him to be removed from the streets. Will Spencer police tell us that Rust is now booked in the Oklahoma County Detention Center, where he is facing a long list of charges. And Kevin and Jolene police say they could not be more relieved. Live wow. in Midtown, Natalie Clydesdale, Oklahoma's News 4.
have Chopper 4 above the scene, McIntyre Lot Chopper 4, where Mason Dunn has been tracking the movement going on around there. You can see Air 1 is landing in the uh, in the neighborhood here on the street. Two, two deputies have been shot multiple times. They were shot by somebody who has left the scene in a Dodge truck uh, hauling a boat. I have just heard that they have spotted that car, so we're going to stay here for a little bit. But Air 1 is landing in the street. You never see this before. Uh, this deputy must be hurt really bad. He's found ahead is some construction that should show this person, slow this person down. You can already see that they're meandering. Oh, see the boat? Okay, they hit the barrels. They're hitting all the barrels. Well, this is probably then where it's going to come to an end. Tinker Tire, just to let you know, this pursuit is, this guy's turned in, headed into Tinker. He, oh no. Those gates are manned. He's trying to get into Tinker. It appears that this has come to the stop at the gate. They're saying he has a AR-15 that was pointed at the gate. Supposedly he's dropped it. And they may be taking him into custody oh, right now, hopefully. I hope so. But we were told, Mason Dunn heard that he had an AR-15, and that's allegedly what he was using to shoot out the windows at law enforcement as they were chasing him, trying to get him to stop after having shot two Oklahoma County deputies. There's the person right now. We don't know what the crime was that uh, deputies were responding to when they went to that house to begin with. Deputies are here at the hospital and uh, just, just praying for them and praying for their families. The law enforcement is it's a tight community and and I'm so thankful they were screaming across the state for my guys. <laughs> oh my we're watching right now as the motorcycle motorcycles lead off to start up that procession to escort <clears throat> excuse me, to escort the body of the sergeant to the medical examiner's office right now. Let me tell you what former Sheriff John Wetzel has to say about this. Bobby, Sergeant Bobby Swartz, was a good man, a superb and dedicated deputy. Here in the moment, and it's still shocking to see how many officers are here right now. As you can see, the procession has already begun from state troopers to county sheriffs, uh, officers and deputies to Oklahoma City PD as well as many other departments here around the state of Oklahoma. They're all here transporting um, Sergeant Bobby Schwartz's body to the medical examiner's office. The sheriff's office confirming tonight Sergeant Bobby Schwartz has died. December would have marked 25 years for Deputy Schwartz with the department. And in just the past 20 minutes, we've learned the man accused of killing Deputy Swartz is 35-year-old Benjamin Plank. He's facing first-degree murder charges and is being held without bail. All of this unfolded in southwest Oklahoma City in a neighborhood near 78th and Young's. That is where News Force Natalie Clydesdale is tonight. Natalie, update us. Well, that's right. This is the street where it all started with deputies attempting to serve that eviction notice. Instead, they were greeted by gunfire, and now the entire Oklahoma law enforcement community is mourning the loss of one of their own. Hey, shots fired. Shots fired. Gunfire ringing out, sending this entire southwest Oklahoma City neighborhood into chaos. Shocked more than anything, kind of surprised. It makes me feel angry, very angry. The deputies were trying to serve an eviction notice to a home on southwest 78th in Young's. Contacted the individual at the front door, um, then went around to the back door. But instead, the suspect greeted them by pulling the trigger on his rifle. Shot the first deputy, the second deputy tried to get that off that deputy out of the way out of the way of gunfire and then he was struck as well I mean I heard bow 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 we know at least one deputy if not more was able to return gunfire uh, at the suspect while deputies were rushed to the hospital the suspect led officers on a wild high-speed chase I just about white male driver he is firing from his window during that pursuit the suspect was firing rounds at officers and 
we had officers as well uh, returning fire at the suspect. The ordeal finally came to an end at the main entrance gate of Tinker Air Force Base. The suspect hogtied and taken into custody. We don't at this time know why he came here, if he purposely drove here, or if he took a wrong turn. Meanwhile, the city mourning the loss of Sergeant Bobby Swartz and praying for the other deputy fighting for his life in the hospital. This was about as routine as it gets. I've been out with both of them numerous times, and they're both professional, extremely professional and extremely careful. Um, unfortunately, something went wrong. We're still waiting to hear an update about the condition of the deputy still in the hospital, and tonight we continue to mourn the fallen officer gone too soon. Reporting live in southwest Oklahoma City, Natalie Clydesdale, Oklahoma's News 4. The Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon less than a month away, and this morning, Governor Kevin Stitt kicking off the Governor's Relay Challenge. Let's check in with News Force Lauren Daniels, who joins us live from downtown Oklahoma City, where the Governor is beginning his two mile training run today. Lauren. Hey guys, good morning. They are about to start running right now. Everyone's all lined up. Governor Stitt this morning is joined by members of the Ranimals. These are folks who really love to run. They have run in every single Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon. You see everyone's getting ready to run here. Also joining him this morning, we know we have uh, Captain Little John from Oklahoma City Police and other law enforcement members. And they've got a little escort right here too, helping him along. They're going to be running two miles and they're off. There they go on their two mile run this morning preparing for the relay race this is the fourth year the governor has run the relay race at the oklahoma city memorial marathon as you know you get the i beat the governor t-shirt if you win the if you beat him in the relay race if you beat his team always a lot of fun every year i've run the relay before different stretches for each runner Welcome, my friends, to the 22nd Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon, a run to remember. And we've been proud to bring you every one of them here on Channel 4. I'm back with my good friend, Oklahoma Hall of Fame broadcaster Linda Cavanaugh, I got to anchor a long time with. And our race analyst, Mark Bravo, is here on a blustery morning. Uh, but I think it's going to be okay for the runners. So. We are happy and honored to be here. As a matter of fact, there have been 34 runners who have run in every marathon since the beginning of this 22 years ago. So congratulations to them, and we look forward to seeing them again and wish them good luck. Hey guys, good morning. We are back, and as you can see, the runners are going by. A lot of excitement here today. They were talking to people all over the area. They're here to support their state. They're here to remember a moment that happened 27 years ago. And they're also here because they have great faith in their community. And the energy is definitely picking up here at the Nichols Hills water station. But it's not just water that keeps the racers going. It's also music. So Yes, we're at the OG&E water stop. And I'm telling you, the people just keep coming. A pleasure to be here and an honor for us to always be here for the last 22 years to do this. That's right. Thanks for coming out and joining us again. Absolutely. Are you Andy, the guy we just called? Why are you hiding, man? Hey, why are you hiding, man? What are you doing? 
Go away. No comments. Are you Andy, the guy we were just calling the emergency maintenance man? I'm a guy. Hey, I, we understand that you can't do anything, but can you give us a number to somebody that can? Tonight, yet another update for the folks still without heat at the Foxcroft apartment complex. Some now without water, too, after their pipes froze. But hope may be on the horizon. This is now our fifth story on the matter, and it's catching the attention of the city, the health department, and an attorney. News Force Kaitor K with tonight's update. Kaitor. The biggest update today is that a local attorney saw News Force coverage of this issue and has decided to represent the tenants of Foxcroft Apartments for free. When it started snowing and the temperatures dropped, it was miserable. Below zero wind chills are freezing the tenants of Foxcroft Apartments. The complex has had no heat at all since September. An anonymous maintenance worker told News 4, Wayner Multifamily manages the complex. He guided us to their office, telling us a regional director of operations drove a white Jeep, which we did see parked in front. Minutes after we knocked on the locked door and left, the white Jeep was moved to the back of the building. Wayner Multifamily later sending News 4 a statement saying that they only recently started managing the Foxcroft apartments and that, quote, taking care of our residents is our top priority and we are actively working to remedy the situation. Meanwhile, downtown, attorney Ryan Owens was helping some of the Foxcroft tenants file a class action lawsuit against the complex owner, National Exchange Title Holder 1031, a judge then granting a temporary injunction in favor of the residents. They now have an order from the District Court of Oklahoma County that they can take back to their landlord and say, you have been ordered by the District Court to turn on the heat. And you've been ordered by the court to not evict anyone for not paying rent until this lawsuit is resolved. Owens is taking the case on pro bono. It's unacceptable. I mean, you, one of our plaintiffs uh, says that it got down to 16 degrees in her apartment Saturday night. You can't live like that. Tenant Kathy Chapman, who is currently staying with her sister, is satisfied to see the law helping them. It was ecstatic. I was so, it was, I can't even find the word I'm looking for, but I was very, very happy. Even with this win, the first official court date lies 10 cold days away. I'm dreading it. Owens and his legal team say they've heard from someone representing the apartment owners who claims they've been working with a plumbing company who's been searching for problematic gas leaks for weeks in an attempt to fix the heating failure. The representative also told Owens any tenant that wants to leave Foxcroft can do so and break their lease with no repercussions. He almost took a step. Applying for a certified copy of baby Elijah's birth certificate last year didn't take long. A mail-in order in November of 2021, and then I was reading online that they were getting it faster online, so I submitted an online one in December. But actually getting the document? Well, she still doesn't have it. The frustrated first-time mom saying when she called the vital records office for help. And she chuckles. And then she said something along the lines of, well, there's nothing I can do for you. <gasps> the family has even celebrated a major milestone waiting for it. We just celebrated his first birthday. And in the meantime, it's caused big problems for this little family. He's Native American. I haven't been able to get any of his benefits. I haven't been able to provide for our family like I should because of a birth certificate. To recap, no tribal benefits means no child care, means no added income for her household. But Jordan says since News 4 got involved, she's already received more answers. I, I woke up to five missed calls and a voicemail. So she said they had a over 8 million records that they had to move, and something may have happened in the works of the move. State officials say they've cut a backlog in half since January and are working through the rest as quickly as possible, telling News 4, quote, once this situation was brought to our attention, we were able to make contact and are currently working with the mother to complete the required forms. Jordan hopes everything will work out, but until then, okay. we're waiting. Really all comes down to the birth certificate and the position that it puts our family in.
In a 69-page report released on Tuesday, the federal government says four out of the five state initiatives to help families and agencies deal with the pandemic were reported to not show any proof that money was used to help those in the most need. In one case, funds were misused in one of the initiatives called Bridge the Gap. A company called Class Wallet was used to help run the program, which was to award families with micro grants. But now the federal government is asking Oklahoma to return the $650,000 given to the company. The audit says that Education Secretary Ryan Walters helped with the contract between the state and Class Wallet. However, he was not Education Secretary at the time. News 4 reached out for comment to both Walters and Class Wallet, but did not get a response. The audit says there were purchases of televisions, air conditioners, and Christmas trees, along with other luxury goods. State Representative Andy Fugate has been a vocal critic of misused gear funds. He says there needs to be new laws regarding no-bid contracts. The buddy system leads to corruption and it needs to stop. The federal report says that the state should have been keeping controls over the companies they were working with. Only one initiative was said to be run properly, which was one headed by State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister at the Department of Education. Governor Kevin Stitt, whose office was in charge of dispersing the funds to different initiatives, says through his spokeswoman, if it is determined that a vendor failed to ensure funds were properly utilized or that any individual misused funds received for educational purposes, the state will take swift and appropriate action. The checkpoints that were in place, the people involved were not doing the things that they needed to do to make sure that this system was being appropriately managed and awarding funds in a manner that was transparent and accountable to the people of Oklahoma. There are people who drill for oil and imagine a lake of it producing barrel after barrel, literally printing money, but the people of Gage are forever thankful for the water that came out of that hole instead. I like it out here. Chief among them, Pat Jacoby, who's been managing this unique outdoor pool for the past 22 summers. You've seen it all out here, huh? <laughs> yeah, I have. <laughs> she lives her life by the pool calendar and can often be found after hours, just sitting by herself, enjoying the setting. Dry sagebrush growing right to the edge and clear mineral water unfiltered in one of the largest outdoor pools in Oklahoma. It's not had anything else but a sand bottom. All we do is pour bleach in here ever so often to keep the steps from getting slick. But Pat does have one rule, mostly for kids. She makes them pass a swim test before they get in the deep end. They have to swim the width of the pool, no matter what parents might tell her. And the parents say, yes, they can. Half of them can't swim. And so they just get angry with me and leave. And I think, that's OK. At least I don't have nobody hurt. Pool width is one thing, but how about the length? We wanted to know if anybody has ever swum from one end to the other without surfacing. But we've had several of them swim up, way up to the little end. It's 100 yards, which is kind of a long way to swim underwater. People who try have time to think of the healing qualities of the mineral water that still fills this pool. They have time to think about this wonderful accidental gift, a literal oasis in far western Oklahoma. And they have lots of time to try to think about anything other than taking a breath until you can't anymore. Gage Beach remains that breath of life in a hot place, a cool green spot on the map, and that offers a challenge if you care to try. In Gage, Galen Culver, News 4. Is this a great state or what?